Hello and welcome to Writer Lens, where we take an in-depth look at film and television from a writer's perspective. So today we're going to be discussing Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and that's uh, partly because, well, we all know there is a uh, upcoming television show. It uh, premieres uh, this evening. Well, late this evening, midnight, <laughs> or uh, 3 a.m. on the East Coast, for those of you who like to stay up late. I might very well be doing that. I'm a big Marvel fan. But we are going to take a look at one of the uh, original films, The Winter Soldier, which introduced uh, Bucky Barnes as uh, the Winter Soldier character. But in discussing this movie, I am going to take a deep dive into Marvel films in general to point out something that I don't know if everybody uh, realizes when they're looking at these films. When you think about Marvel films, you can just think about the scope, right? There are so many films, and also we think about the success. So many films, so much success, and yet you kind of wonder, why is it that people aren't getting bored? Doesn't Aren't these films repetitive? Isn't it something where eventually, you know, people would get sick of superheroes? Aren't we essentially just seeing the same thing over and over and over again? Well, the truth of the matter is... <laughs> No, these are not the same movies over and over again. <laughs> no, they really aren't. And we're going to talk about that in uh, today's discussion, which is the difference between genre and plot types. Now, people don't always know the difference between the two things, so I am going to be uh, discussing this. So, genre is a category of art that comes with a set of expectations for the audience. When we uh, step into a superhero film, we have an idea of what we might expect. You know, we're expecting some sort of character that has a wish fulfillment element. You know, I've always wished I could do this um, often we expect this will be some sort of good versus evil or some sort of uh, moral uh, principle that will be acted out upon these characters that are often archetypes. So we expect some broad characters. Uh, we do expect that it might be a little cartoony in terms of the characterization that we're going to have broad characters that are dynamic and uh, have a lot of contrast between them. This is not going to be, you know, we don't expect the same sort of subtlety as other genres. In fact, we don't even want that. We want to see larger than life personalities a lot of the time. But if you think about it, in something like science fiction, you know, you have expectations for a plausible yet uh, believable reality. So that comes into play. If you think about fantasy, uh, you think about a world that is rich and lush and has fantastical elements, hence the name fantasy. But we don't think of the same sort of plausibility in that, you know, you don't really have to explain where dragons came from in the same way we expect from science. However, beyond that, there's a little bit of a deeper dive because if you think in the terms of sci-fi, the book Contact... And the book Ender's Game, well, they're quite different from one another for lots of reasons from a story perspective. But we know that both of these uh, stories are in the science fiction genre. I could do the same thing in the fantasy genre with The Fellowship of the Ring, which is in many ways a very different story construction than Prisoner of Azkaban, right? Now... What's going on here? Because nobody would debate that Harry Potter is in a fantasy, or Fellowship of the Ring is in fantasy, or Ender's Game is not sci-fi, or Contact is not sci-fi. What is going on? How There are different things at play, and that gets into story types or plot types, categories of stories that each come with their own set of expectations. And that's kind of that subheader. So... Or honestly, and sometimes I feel like the genre is more like the subheader and the plot type is really uh, what is paramount in terms of making a story work. Plot types, you know, we have mystery type plots, romance type plots, heist 
type plots, monster type plots, and all of these exist within different genres. You know, there are um, uh, stories that are militaristic, but yet they would be in the sci-fi category. Uh, there are romances, and yet they might be in the fantasy genre. So, Plot types are important to look out for as well. You don't want to just focus on genre. If you just focus on genre, sometimes what you can end up doing is you can think of, you know, the most famous works in that genre and just kind of emulate that, which is not necessarily a bad idea. But you might limit yourself, and especially if you're going to do a big series like uh, Marvel's doing, instead of them just limiting themselves to just the stereotypical, archetypical uh, superhero genre, which often has the plot type of the hero's journey and the origin story. Instead, they said, we're going to make each of our movies different from each other. So Captain America the Winter Soldier has less in common with Superman the movie, which you might think of as the archetypical comic book movie, than it really does something like the Patriot Games. Uh, Captain America the Winter Soldier is really a political thriller at its heart in terms of its story type. And uh, Ant-Man, again, doesn't resemble Superman the movie as much as something like Sneakers, uh, a heist film. It's a different story type, which comes with a different set of expectations. So one thing you want to ask yourself when you're writing a book is what are the expectations for the type of story I am telling, for the plot that I am doing, not necessarily only the genre. The genre does come with a set of expectations. So, you know, you can't have a talking elephant in a sci-fi book without having some sort of technological explanation, whereas in a fantasy book, you can get away with it, right? So there are different expectations. However, your plot is going to come up with a different set of expectations. Um, if you're doing a high story, there are sets of expectations in terms of you expect them to build a team and every member of the team has their own special skill and you expect there to be some sort of twist that makes the heist more interesting towards the end and things like that. So each plot has tropes that are avoided at your own peril. Sometimes and often studying story types might be more helpful than your genre because sometimes genre are the more shallow things, the more superficial things uh, than uh, your plot. Your plot is often where uh, people can really get hung up. They, they have an idea of the fantastical elements that make fantasy interesting, the, the beautiful worlds, uh, the magic, things like that. What they sometimes will miss out on is those story pieces that make the story work, right? And uh, often they won't even realize that they're not, you know, what kind of plot they're writing. And uh, you'll be like, you know, you set up the expectation that this is a big mystery plot and I, I, you're not really answering any questions. And they're like, oh, I, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. So you want to make sure that you are fulfilling your promise to the audience based on the story genre that you are in. Uh, romances, for example, uh, generally come with the expectation of different things. You expect the couple's going to have some sort of either friction at the beginning or maybe they hit it off, but there's going to be friction at some point that's going to pull them apart. They're going to figure things out. Usually they end up in a happily ever after. Uh, honestly, this is the same format you'll see in buddy cop movies like The Heat or a film like Toy Story. Uh, these have the same sort of story elements as a romance because these are relationship stories. And again, mysteries, you know, you think of the classic Agatha Christie uh, stories where you have an expectation that the author is a little bit ahead of you, that they're going to have a fun twist and they're going to set up the clues so you could have predicted it, but you kind of want to not have predicted it. You kind of want the author to be smarter than you. And the same thing happens in a book like Prisoner of Azkaban, which is really a mystery plot at its heart. It is sometimes they call those information plots or even a movie like Arrival, uh, definitely in the sci-fi genre. But it is a mystery plot. There are clues given throughout the story that you're trying to figure out uh, what are these aliens doing here, you know, and the audience can follow along the story and figure out from the clues the story what is going on. Um, 
uh, uh, we have a question. David says, I hear mention of tropes a few times in different shows about either making sure to have them or to avoid them. Are you aware of any sites or places to learn more about tropes for each genre of plots? Um, the famous one is TV Tropes, which will could literally suck you into a vortex and you'll never get out of it because there's so much on there. But it is helpful just to see what is going on mechanically speaking. The thing about tropes is I would say it's not a matter of, oh, you need to make sure you have them or you don't need to make sure you avoid them at all costs. You need to be aware of them because if you are going against a trope, it means you're defying the audience expectation, which can sometimes be a great thing. Uh, audiences like to be surprised. Sometimes. Sometimes what they're looking for from a story is comfort. You know, the world's a confusing place. It's troubling. Sometimes they they want a story where they know it's going to work out. You know, uh, why do we watch uh, movies that we know the ending to before we start? Because we want that comfort. And you could say, well, I don't watch movies like that. I mean, in a sense, you do. I mean, I'm sure you didn't watch Captain America the Winter Soldier concerned that they were going to kill off the character of Captain America. Nobody was really that concerned about that. That's not the kind of plot it is. You know that the hero is going to end up uh, victorious. Now, there is an inversion of that that Marvel did in the film uh, Infinity War, which defied the trope. And one thing they did to make that work was they set up Thanos as the protagonist of that story. So essentially, Thanos uh, is successful so it's just we're seeing a story from the standpoint of who would typically be the antagonist. So that's a way to flip that trope and make it work. I believe if they had not done that, if they had not made Thanos the protagonist and instead done it just like every other movie, I don't think that ending would have landed nearly as well as it did. Instead, now you have people with the shirts, you know, Thanos was right and things like that because they related to that character. So that is a look at the difference between genre and plot types. This is something to be aware of, that there's really two different factors in play in terms of audience expectations whenever you write a story. And just keep that in mind, that you want to have an idea of the type of plot you're writing as well as the expectations for the genre. Don't, you know, and also uh, th that can be very freeing depending on uh, what genre you're looking at. All right, so let's talk about Captain America, the Winter Soldier from a story structure format. Uh, this is my little seven story structure based on a lot of different things, my own little riff on it. So we have a hook. The hook of uh, Captain America is Captain America is coping with modern life and mostly solitary. He's kind of off on his own. Um, he's running around all by himself, and he is, you know, not really at peace with a modern life just yet. All right. The question of the film is, will Captain America find out the truth behind Project Insight? It's set up pretty early that this is this big mystery for him to find out. This is very, uh, this is a mystery plot, a political thriller, but you know, it is, uh, some people call it an information plot. You know, that's the type of story it is. So the decision is Captain America accepts the flash drive from Nick Fury if he was like, nah, I'm not really going to get involved in any of this. Um, obviously, the story would be over. <laughs> um, the consequences of such, of course, is eventually Captain America will end up wanted by the government because he's essentially on the wrong side of the political uh, situation because we eventually find out that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been co-opted um, and... Uh, at this point, we don't know that. We think uh, it's just uh, the Winter Soldier is out for Nick Fury. But eventually we find out that uh, pretty much everybody will be out for him. <laughs> so the fun in games is Captain America and Black Widow continue to find clues while on the run for sh from S.H.I.E.L.D. So uh, the situation continues to escalate and get more interesting. And you have a lot of fun action sequences. Uh, the pit is when uh, Captain America realizes the Winter Soldier is Bucky. Well, that's a terrible revelation. Uh, the person you're out to find, the assailant who is uh, running loose, is actually somebody you had a close relationship with. So that's pretty awful. And then they also find out that Project Insight is going to kill millions of people. So those are some pretty high stakes, right? And obviously at this point too, Captain America is quite on his own because the whole S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, department has been co-opted. So that goes in on that as well. 
So Captain America ends up facing off against Bucky and S.H.I.E.L.D. And in the New World, Captain America now realizes S.H.I.E.L.D. was compromised and is on a hunt to find his friend. So he kind of has a sense of purpose that he didn't really have. He starts the movie and it's like, eh, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of going through the motions. And at the end, he now has a mission, which is actually going to lead him into the next movie. So... Pretty interesting. Uh, this is actually a great way of doing a series is when your new world puts your character in a new position that clearly sets up for the next book because it still gives you that growth. They learn something, they accomplish something, um, but there's still that next step that they want to take. Uh, I often point to uh, Catching Fire, The Hunger Games as a great example of a cliffhanger ending that satisfied the requirements of that story for the second book but yet uh very powerfully made you wonder what will happen next because the consequences of it are so interesting i want to see what happens next now, when you look at the character uh, dynamic here, we have uh, Captain America as the protagonist. The antagonist is, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. Hy slash Hydra. Uh, uh, distraction character, Bucky, uh, is a representation of kind of the person that Captain America could be. Uh, he could just be bitter and angry about the fact that he was uh, co-opted by uh, political forces and just be, you know, a renegade. But he's not. Uh, relationship character is uh, Black Widow. She's the one that kind of leads him through the journey. Uh, talks to him about um, his uh, emotional state. Things like that. Nick Fury plays kind of a dual role in my opinion. Of both the opposition and the reason. He plays the role of. I don't know if we can quite pull this off a few times. And then uh, he's often just a planner. Falcon is really the support. Uh, he is... Not really, uh, you know, much of a stumbling block. He's more along for the ride in this movie. Uh, and I have Peggy Carter as the emotion character. She doesn't have a very big role, but her one little uh, scene does show you an insight into Captain America's emotional state. The fact that he lost so much by, uh, you know, being frozen. He lost his his uh his chance to grow up in a world he understood and all of that. So it's that emotional reaction to uh, the world that he's in. All right, so let's look at the dialogue here because Marvel does do dialogue quite well, in my opinion. Um, it's something that uh, honestly makes them stand out in comparison to others in the genre. Uh, you're probably, I mean, with the exception of maybe Christopher Nolan's work, you're probably not going to quote many lines from a DC movie. They're just not going to stand out. They tend to be much more mechanical, um, at least in my opinion. Whereas Marvel uh, is very character focused. And I really think that's one reason why the Marvel movies have done a lot better. And there's various reasons, but I think that is one. All right, so uh, this is right at the beginning of the film where uh, Sam is talking to Steve, and then he says, must have freaked you out coming home after the whole defrosting thing. And Steve said, it takes some getting used to. It's good to meet you, Sam. Sam says, it's your bed, right? And Steve says, what's that? And Sam says, your bed. It's too soft. When I was over there, I'd sleep on the ground and use rock for pillows like a caveman. Now I'm home lying in my bed, and it's like... It's like lying on a marshmallow. I feel like I'm going to sink right to the floor. Now, what I like about this is uh, it's a physical reminder of that sense of security that makes them feel uncomfortable because they're used to being out. Uh, they're used to being soldiers. They're used to being out on the force. And now they're home and it's like kind of the what next? What do I do with myself? But uh, it's, say, it's stating it in a way that is relatable to everybody and i just like that sensory detail about it i think that's uh that's a really good way of, of putting it across but you also see just how conversational uh the dialogue is you know sam must have freaked you out coming home after that whole defrosting thing it's just very casual uh this really does feel like uh, the way people would naturally converse you also notice that uh sam is a little bit more casual than Steve, and Steve is much more casual than Black Widow, who is even more casual than Nick Fury, in my opinion, if you follow along. 
they do do a good job with the diction between characters. So Natasha says, did you do anything fun Saturday night? And Steve says, well, the guys from my barbershop quartet are dead. So no, not really. And then she says, you know, if you ask Christian out from statistics, she'd probably say yes. And then he says, that's why I don't ask. And then she says, too shy or too scared? And he says, too busy. Now, this is a thing that's going to come up throughout. And uh, this is something that, like I said, Natasha is really the relationship character. She's the one that's trying to get Captain America to move on with his life. She can tell he's stuck. You know, he is f still frozen for, you know, uh, mentally in the past. He doesn't know how to cope with modern life, really. He doesn't really have a sense of place. He's not really integrating into society, and she's trying to get him out there. All right, so let's move on to uh, Steve and Nick Fury's conversation after uh, their first encounter on uh, the uh, ship. Which, where he finds out that Natasha was doing a secondary mission that he wasn't aware of. So he, uh, Steve says, the hostages could have died, Nick. And Nick said, I sent the greatest soldier in history to make sure that didn't happen. And Steve says, soldiers, uh, soldiers trust each other. That's what makes it an army, not a bunch of guys running around and shooting guns. And Nick says, the last time I trusted somebody, I lost an eye. Look, I didn't want you doing anything you weren't comfortable with. Agent Romanoff is comfortable with everything. And Steve says, I can't lead a mission when the people I'm leading have missions of their own. And Nick says, it's called compartmentalization. Nobody spills the secrets because nobody knows them all. Steve says, except you. Nick says, you're wrong about me. I do share. I'm nice like that. <laughs> but uh, you'll notice that like, uh, Nick Fury is very cold uh, or calculated, you know. I wouldn't say cold, that's a little harsh, but he's very calculated, he's very precise in his language. It's not it's not super stilted, but it is, you know, much more, you know, all the time. And you can read a quote from Nick Fury and know who's talking a fair amount of the time. <laughs> Somebody is wondering where uh, Samuel Jackson's uh, tendency to be a little profane went. Um, that is not the character of Nick Fury in the same way. <laughs> All right. So uh, here is that scene I was talking about where you see Peggy um, demonstrating that emotional state of Captain America. So Steve is having the conversation for as long as I can remember. I just wanted to do what was right. I guess I'm not quite sure what that is anymore. And I thought I could throw myself back in and follow orders. Serve. It's just not the same. See, so this uh, Peggy really is that character that allows uh, uh, Captain America to bear his soul, to do that sort of emotional speaking, let us into his uh, emotional state. And then she says, you're always so a dramatic look. You saved the world. We rather mucked it up. And Steve said, you didn't. Knowing that you helped found S.H.I.E.L.D. is half the reason I stay. Peggy says, hey, the world has changed and none of us can go back. All we can do is our best. And sometimes the best that we can do is start over. And then she has her whole thing where it's like she has Alzheimer's or some sort of mental um, uh, some sort of mental uh, faculties where she uh doesn't remember the conversation she just had, and she uh, is like, oh, Steve, you're alive, you know, and it's just this uh, constant reminder of what he gave up. So it's a very, very uh, good scene, and this is a character that you do not want to neglect to have. Uh, yes, it was a heartbreaking scene, and uh, it really works well because it's believable that Steve would, you know, bear his soul to this character. And uh, it's also uh, great that this character uh, demonstrates that loss because she literally, you know, uh, has to make him relive this whole all this time being lost moment over and over again. You know, it's a demonstration. It is a show not telling, which is great. But yes, don't neglect having an emotion character in your story. You need to have a character that allows... Uh, your protagonist to bear their soul and also somebody that you know has that emotional reaction or allows the audience to have an emotional reaction to the world around them all right so here we have uh besides the visual her age just show the lost oh that's true yes uh just the fact that she is uh elderly looking and he is not you have that visual uh, juxtaposition. That's a really good uh, point there, Daryl. So again, that's a show and not telling right there. 
All right, so Steve says, stop lying. And Natasha says, I only act like I know everything, Rogers. And Steve says, I bet you knew Fury hired the pirates, didn't you? And Natasha says, well, it makes sense. The ship was dirty. Fury needed a way in. So do you. And Steve said, I'm not going to ask you again. And Natasha says, I know, Kyo Fury. Most of the intelligence community doesn't believe he exists. The ones who do call him the Winter Soldier. He's credited with over two dozen assassinations in the last 50 years. So he's a ghost story. I, I like this little interruption, right? Um, it does break up what is essentially a long info dump, but you see this character breaking in with a sort of snarky, comedic sort of comment. Uh, that's not a bad strategy to do. If you find that your character is off pontificating, have somebody break it up. It's not a bad idea. It can it can help the audience not get bored. <laughs> and then uh, and you'll notice too how they bookend this scene. So uh, Natasha says, five years ago I was escorting a nuclear submarine, blah 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 blah. And then she says, when her soldier was there, I was covering my engineer, so he shot him straight through me. Soviet slug, no rifling. Bye bye bikinis. And then he says, yeah, I bet you look terrible in them now. So again, after this long info dump, you end with a snarky comment and a joke. And it just, it's like a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? <laughs> a little bit of entertainment helps the fact that eh, we just got a little information dump going on here. We, it's a little backstory. Uh, it works. It works well. Keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to throw in some humor, some snark, some sarcasm when somebody is off pontificating or monologuing on you. Uh, here we have a cute little scene between the two of them. Again, this fill, this is this little subplot where Natasha's constantly pushing Steve into a relationship. And Steve says, it was not my first kiss since 1945. I'm 95. I'm not dead. And she says, nobody's special, though. And Steve says, believe it or not, it's kind of hard to find someone with shared life experience. And Natasha says, well, that's all right. You make something up. What, like you? Well, I don't know. The truth is a matter of circumstances. It's not all things to all people all the time. And neither am I. So this is kind of more or less what what uh, what Captain America kind of has to learn is that you sort of have to make your own way in the world. You know, he starts out, he's like, I just don't know what to do with myself. I just want to take orders and that's not really working. And Natasha's like, yeah, no, that's that's not really how it's going to work because this is a messy place. And yeah, the world isn't black and white. It's pretty gray. It's pretty gross cope you know <laughs> and captain america is very much a you know starts out the series is very much a black and white you know i'm going to be on the side of good and and he ends up having to make his own way which is going to lead you to the third movie in this uh mini trilogy which is captain america civil war where he's going to have to go even stronger against the government and really position himself as essentially the bad guy or the criminal because he does not agree with the government restrictions on superheroes. You can also look at it as a flirtatious Natasha. Oh yeah, there's definitely that going on as well. She is toying with him a little bit because that's something she just naturally uh, does. It's part of her character. She was trained into that sort of thing and uh, she just enjoys it. I think she understands too that Captain America is a very reserved, gentlemanly sort of person, and so she's going to kind of push his buttons a little bit just because it's fun. <laughs> All right, so here we have another information dump, a big twist when they get to uh, New Jersey and they find out the truth behind uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., and uh, uh, Dr. Zola is talking about Hydra, and Steve's like, Hydra died with the Red Skull. And Dr. Zola says, cut off one head, two more shall take its place. And Steve says, prove it. And then we have the villain monologue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these are always fun to write. Um, uh, the fun thing about this one is they do hang a lantern on it in just a moment. Accessing our accessing archive. Hydra was founded on the belief that humanity could not be trusted with its own freedom. What we did not realize was that if you try to take that freedom, they resist. The war taught us much. Humanity needed to surrender its freedom willingly. After the war, Shield was founded and I was recruited. The new Hydra grew, a beautiful parasite inside Shield. For 70 years, Hydra has been secretly feeding crisis, reaping war, and when history did not cooperate, history was changed. And Natasha's like, that's impossible. She would have stopped you. So again, you have an interruption. Now, this isn't a snarky or a jokey one, but you have somebody cutting in to be like, well, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. And it just breaks up the flow of this long speech. 
accidents will happen. Hydra created a world so chaotic that hum humanity is finally ready to sacrifice its freedom to gain its security. Once the purification process is complete, Hydra's new world order will rise. We won, Captain. Your death amounts to the same as your life, of zero sum. As I was saying... And then he actually interrupts him at this point to ask a question. What's on this drive? Project Insight requires insight, so I wrote an algorithm. What kind of algorithm? What does it do? The answer to your question is fascinating. Unfortunately, you shall be too dead to hear it. And then they find out that he has launched a missile, and uh, he was, I was installing you! Yes. So uh, they give a reason why he is uh, monologuing here. Which is kind of nice, because, yeah, it is a little silly. Why are you telling him all this? Of course, why is he telling all this before they blow him up? Yeah, you know, it's like the Great Muppet Caper. It's plot exposition. It has to go somewhere, right? <laughs> so, yes, you do have to uh, accept a little bit of contrivance in order to make it work. They could have just found all of this stuff. You know, they could have just found all this on computers. I think having that character do that speech... It's just so good. It's so juicy. I can. I wouldn't want to resist that, even if it's not particularly uh, believable. It works just fine. And, you know, there is the whole attitude that villainous people often like to brag about their own villainy. It's, it's not like it's completely ridiculous. But what you do see here is one reason why, another reason why I think uh, Marvel films work, and that is beyond the character, they do tend to get at themes, and their themes tend to resonate. And I think one reason why is because Marvel doesn't go about trying to be like, we're going to do a parable about this political topic and we're going to have this is a standee for this person and this is a standee for this person i think what they try to do is they talk about bigger things um and it really means that i know people that have seen their movies and they have taken completely different perspectives on it depending on their political standpoint and uh, to be honest, I I recommend uh, that that's a good strategy. I'm more of the Tolkien uh, sense of uh, writing where he says, you know, he really doesn't like allegory where it makes the author so much in charge and the reader doesn't really get to think for themselves. I, I do like stories that tend to focus on, you know, basic human themes like this is, you know, the balance between, you know, freedom and control and how, you know, people can use chaos to seize control and these are all things that no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on you're going to relate to you'll just apply it to different things depending on your viewpoint right and so i think that makes it work a lot better as a story it also doesn't date itself as much because you know if it's a, just a complete analog and it's like this is an analog for this political figure well you know in 30 40 years First of all, your view on that political figure could change, a scandal could emerge, history may rewrite it differently than you think in that moment, or you thought that person was a really important political figure and it turns out, eh, not so much, and nobody really knows who you're talking about. Anyway, just something to think about. All right, so uh, here is uh, where you really get into this kind of relationship character moment with Natasha. And Natasha says, when I first joined S.H.I.E.L.D., I thought I was going straight, but I guess I just traded in the KGB for HYDRA. I thought I knew whose lies I was telling, but I guess I can't tell the difference anymore. And then Steve says, there's a chance you might be in the wrong business, which is a repeat of what... Uh, uh, Natasha told him earlier because he says he was looking for a friend and she says well I guess you're in the wrong business and now he's like well I guess you're in the wrong business and Natasha says I owe you and she says it's okay and Natasha says if it was the other way around it was down to me to save your life and you be honest with me would you trust me to do it and Steve says I would now and I'm always honest <laughs> And then she says, you seem pretty chipper for someone who just found out they died for nothing. And he's like, I guess I just like to know who I'm fighting. <laughs> I just like that attitude. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, this really gets to the core of this story. Like I said, it gets to the fact that uh, Steve has to move forward. He has to uh, realize that he he uh he what he, he says there's a chance you might be in the wrong business he's really catching on to the fact that this kind of blind faith in authority is not really going to answer his lack of drive or lack of purpose he's going to have to find purpose within himself now you can say well aren't you reading a little bit into it i mean in a sense yes i mean this is not 
super huge and neon lights. It's a little, it's more subtly in. And I think that's another reason why these films do well is they do understand at their base rate, they're trying to entertain you. So it's a fun yarn and there's political intrigue and all of that. They're not really trying to two by four you with all that kind of stuff. But I think that's good. I don't think that's actually a negative. So anyway, now we find out uh, that the insight is uh project insight is a hit list and i i love the way that this is put it's um the 21st century is a digital book zola taught hydra how to read it your bank records medical histories voting patterns emails phone calls your sat scores zola's algorithm evaluates people's past to predict their future and again, this is something that resonates with everybody. The theme that so much of our lives now are archived, they're digital, they're sold, who knows who's looking at it, what kind of various purpose they could be doing with it. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned, you know, talking about Google, you could look at this in a bunch of different ways, depending on who you're suspicious of, which, you know, this political body or this corporation or whatever. So uh, it's great. It works really well and it resonates as not only just a fun thriller, but it does uh, resonate with legitimate concerns that we have it's kind of like horror you know horror does that as well a lot of horror is dealing with uh, moral issues and uh, psychological issues that people have in society you know superhero films when done properly um do that as well and uh having these big broad archetypes you know you literally have somebody that's called captain america and is kind of like this ultimate symbol of what we think America should be like if America was personified. Um, you know, you can't always get away with that in a book. So when you have it, it's great to use it and uh, talk about things and themes. All right. So uh, here's another little relationship character moment with Natasha where uh, Steve says, uh, whatever he did helped Bucky survive the fall. They must have found him and he drifts off. And then Natasha has to tell him, none of that is your fault, Steve. You do get a sense that he would just blame himself. To some degree, you almost have a sense that that almost is speaking of just the world in general, right? He was not there to involve himself in any of this. And so he was frozen. And knowing the kind of personality he is, he might even kind of blame himself a little bit i mean you notice in the scene with peggy she's like you know we're the ones who mucked it up it kind of uh, resolves him of that responsibility because otherwise he might feel a little bit like that himself all right so at this point uh captain america really uh gets that third act push where he is now fully in charge of the story uh, often in stories uh, the first act there's a little bit of a drive and the second act is often reacting to the an antagonist because the protagonist just can't get their footing and then by the third act then they can take a proactive push back against the antagonist and be uh, victorious excuse me but here you can see he's in a different sort of attitude we're not salvaging anything we're not just taking down the carriers nick we're taking down shield so now he's speaking to nick you know he is feeling like he is the empowered one that um is on the side of right and he's no longer just taking nick's or orders you gave me this mission this is how it ends shield's been compromised you said so yourself hydra grew right under your nose and nobody noticed and i like his response why do you think we're meeting in this cave? I noticed. <laughs> and and this is something Marvel does well is is interlacing that humor. Uh it just it not only is entertaining, but it does make it feel more human. You know, uh, people in real life do quip. They do act sarcastic at times, even uh when it's inappropriate, you know, dark sense of humor and things like that. Uh don't be afraid to do that. It's not going to uh, undermine the drama of your story. In fact, it will often add to it because it will just make it feel more realistic. Uh, so st I like the Steve's line though. Even if you have, would you have told me or would you have compartmentalized that too? Shield, Hydra, it all goes. And then Maria says, he's right. And then Sam says, don't look at me. I do what he does, just slower. And yeah, that's his character. Like I said, he's the, he's the, he's the sidekick. He is the uh, helper. And uh, Nick says, well, looks like you're giving the orders now, Captain. This is a little on the nose there, writers. I'm just saying, but it does clue in the audience as to what's going on. But for those of you in the back row that didn't quite see what was going on in that scene, I'm going to just be like, all right, here's what's going on. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do that.
you know. All right, now here is the big speech that uh, Steve has to give. And uh, what I like is the very end. So it's a lot of different things. A lot of, he's a lot of um, uh, ex exposition sort of thing, but uh, works well. He says, I know I'm asking a lot, but the price of freedom is high. It is all, it always has been, and it's a price I'm willing to pay. And if I'm the only one, then so be it. But I'm willing to bet I'm not. I like it. It's a nice challenge to everybody. And what he is ultimately willing to do is put himself out there and be like, well, I'm just laying the cards on the table. If it's just about me, then okay, I guess I'm going to sacrifice myself for the greater good. But I'm hoping that's not the case. <laughs> um, works out really well. And then we have our confrontation with uh, Steve and Bucky. And this works really well because not only is this a cool epic fight scene because you have Captain America against somebody that is on his level physically. So that's a great thing to do when you have a character that is overpowered. You know, find a good foil that's equally overpowered because otherwise the stakes are not super high, right? Um, but not only is it that, not only is this a physical matchup, but you have the sense that Steve doesn't even want to use his superhuman abilities against this person. You know, he doesn't even want to fight them. So that just makes it so much more interesting. And uh, Brandon Sanderson, the fantasy writer, put this very well. And he has a rule that is limitations of magic are a lot more interesting than the abilities of magic. And it's true. What we often find interesting in stories where you have characters with super abilities is what limits them at that point. Because that brings them down to earth, that gives them stakes, that gives us emotional interest. I mean, and you can just give an example. This is an example uh, that he uh, gave, and that is, imagine, you know, you can fly. You have the ability to fly. Okay, well now imagine you can fly, but only when your parents are asleep. Immediately, it's just much more interesting, right? Because now you're like, okay, well, you know, does that mean you're going to want to move to a place where there are a different time zone so then you can fly in the middle of the daytime? Or are you going to give them sleeping pills? Or, you know, it's just, it's just, it makes a lot more uh, interest. And so if you ever have characters in your book, uh, whether they uh, use magic or even uh, technology. If you're writing sci-fi, it's the limitations of technology that can be interesting. If you just have an overpowered character like, you know, a Sherlock character who's just so incredibly smart, again, it's the limitations that tend to make them interesting. So do not neglect those limitations. All right, so we get to the very end of the film where uh, they've made a big mess of this Project Insight and now the military is... A little bit miffed about all that government property getting thrown into the river. <laughs> uh, the general says, why haven't we heard from Captain Rogers? And Natasha says, I don't know what there is left for him to say. I think the wreck in the middle of the Potomac made his point fairly eloquently. Well, he could explain how this country expected to maintain its national security now that he is laid and you have laid waste to our intelligence apparatus. Hydra is selling you lies, not intelligence. Many of you, many of which you seem to have a personal hand in telling. Agent, you should know there are some on this committee who feel, given your service record, both in this country and against it, that you belong in the penitentiary, not mouthing off on Capitol Hill. And this is where you get that good little moment, right? And this is a nice little button on it. And this is another good thing that they did. They didn't have to have this scene to explain the fallout of what happened. But by doing it, it does ground it in a bit more of a sense of reality. There would be a consequence to doing this. You know, they went against the government and they just took down this whole system, right? There would be some sort of consequence, but um, I do like the way this goes. Uh, you're not going to put me in prison. You're not going to put any of us in prison. You know why? Do enlighten us. Because you need us. Yes, the world is a vulnerable place, and yes, we help to make it that way, but we're also the ones best qualified to defend it. So if you want to arrest me, arrest me. You know where to find me. Yep. So uh, it's, uh, it's just a really powerful little mm-hmm. And you're like, yeah, you know what? That's a good point. I mean, sure, they'll be really upset about it, but it's like, eh, what could they really do about it? 
And uh, we end up with our little cliffhanger. And that's that's almost a little bit of a cliffhanger in of itself. You know, you're ending with the superhero characters not in particularly great standing with the government, which is going to come into play in the next Captain America film, Civil War, right? But it's wrapped up enough that we're not so paranoid that we don't think it's a good conclusion. But we're interested. Uh, but we go, they go a little bit further with their cliffhanger here where uh, they have the final scene with Natasha and Steve. And like I have said a bunch of times, if you're watching the Rider Lens, uh, the way to have a great ending is the protagonist defeats the antagonist, and then they find the relationship character, and they have a nice little shaking hands moment, and then you drop the curtain. Here we are! So Natasha says, you should be honored. That's about as close as he gets to saying thank you. Um, which is an acknowledgement of the growth that uh, Captain America had in this movie from an order taker to a colleague. You know, he had that growth. And uh, Captain America says, not going with him? No, not staying here? I blow all my covers. I gotta go figure out a new one. That might take a while. I'm counting on it. The thing you asked for, I called in a few favors from Kiev. Will you do me a favor? Call that nurse. So we kind of button, we go back to that. She's trying to push him into a romantic uh, relationship. So it's a nice little way to, uh, it's a nice little thread to follow throughout the plot. And it's a fun little character quirk that she's particularly obsessed with getting Captain America in a relationship with somebody. It's fun. Um, Steve says, she's not a nurse and you're not a shield agent. What was her name again? Sharon. She's nice. And then she says, be careful, Steve. You might not want to pull on that thread as she hands him the information for the winter soldier. And then he has this conversation with Falcon saying, you know, you don't have to do this. And Falcon in that great little support character way is like, mm -hmm. well, we're going to do it. And then we move, uh, forward into that next, uh, movie, a uh, civil war. So, that's a little dissection of the dialogue. You can tell um, when you look at it, you know, it really does jump off the page. Uh, a lot of people will think with Marvel films, it's a lot about, you know, the special effects, and it's a lot about the acting and the visuals, and I'm not saying that those do not have a factor in the success of the movies. However, we can point to plenty of bigger budgeted movies, uh, movies with terrific actors, um, terrific special effects that is, didn't do the same sort of passion. And I think the writing really uh, does carry the Marvel films a lot further than others, especially within that superhero genre. And especially when it comes to the character work, uh, the concept of switching around the story structures, the plot structures per movie to avoid fatigue, and um, that... Uh, that human realism, you know, the comedy, the uh, the casual way people converse with each other and things like that. It's it's a big, big factor. So do we have any comments out there? I know I've been rattling on for a little while here. Anybody have any comments about Captain America? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, we try to have others. Uh, he was talking about the story doctor. Yeah. Uh, the flip side of the writer's lend is, is the story doctor. So yeah, I tried to do, uh, both. The so story doctor, by the way, is going to take place, uh, next Sunday at 8 PM. Um, for those of you who enjoy, uh, a quick writing challenge. We will have our tale in a day on a uh, Saturday night, which is 8 PM. And so uh, that will be a bunch of story prompts. So last time it was a raptor, a warehouse, a sudden change of weather. And uh, why did you do that? And uh, we had a, quite a few submissions and it was a lot of fun. So you have 24 hours to write something based on prompts such as that. Uh, you know, not, we're not asking you to write a whole book. We're talking about, you know, flash fiction, you know, under uh, 2,000 words, something like that. So that's what we're looking for. But uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, tale in a day. So look for that. That will be, like I said, the kickoff for that will be Saturday night at 8. Tomorrow morning, I'll do my ride aerobics at 9 a.m. And uh, that's a fun 15-minute warm-up to get you ready for your writing. Yeah, The Winter Soldier is probably my favorite of all the Marvel movies as just an individual film. Um, I just think it's quite tight. 
I like the plot. Some of the other ones, their plots get a little bit thorny. Uh, Civil War is actually an example of that, although there's a lot of great moments in Civil War, but the villain's plot is fairly convoluted and doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you get to the end of it, but uh, it's got so much great character work that most people don't really worry about it. <laughs> the Winter Soldier does, in my opinion, make a lot of coherent sense as just a plot, and I like a lot of the themes it touches on because I think that's really cool. All right, any other, any other uh, comments? Somebody says they needed to watch Civil War throughout three days. A little overwhelming, I guess, with all the different pieces going on. <laughs> yeah, Civil War is an interesting one from a, from a plot structure standpoint because it's rather com it's rather complicated. Of course, then you get to Infinity War and uh, and um, Endgame, which are you know, massive stories. All right. Well, I will see you around Autocrit Live. If you have any suggestions of movies or TV shows that you would like to see a writer lens for, uh, please let me know. You can always email me at uh, daniel at autocrit.com and you can let me know something that you would like to see me uh, put under the writer lens and uh, talk about because. As you can see, I like to analyze things and I like to talk about it. So, <laughs> but I want to talk about works that you are interested in. So, Daniel at autocrit.com, if you have any uh, suggestions uh, for uh, movies. Otherwise, I will see you around Autocrit Live. Thank you so much uh, for joining me.